growing up, I developed, a, I guess, a, belief, a strong belief that a small group of people with compassion and kindness in their hearts could change the world. And you know, I think I learned it from watching my mum. Because my mum is a really, really generous person, and I watched when she did really, really lovely things for people, and it really lit their day up. And I noticed that when people were feeling better, that they would be kind to other people. And even just as a small child, I thought, isn't that really fascinating, like this kind of ripple type effect? And another thing that I used to hear a lot when I was a child was people saying, if you live from the heart, it's good for the heart. I didn't really know what that meant, actually, as a child. But years later, I ended up working as a scientist in one of the world's biggest pharmaceutical companies. And I was helping to develop drugs for cardiovascular disease and for cancer. And although I was interested in doing that, I was, you know, I trained, my PhD was in learning how to build big, complicated molecules and stuff. But I was much more interested in what are the kind of lifestyle things that we could do, not necessarily uh, treating something when you're ill, but what can we do uh, before we get ill? To, instead of being ill, what can we do with our lives? You know, the, what kind of foods can we eat? You know, what kind of, you know, should we take exercise? And I became really interested in the cardiovascular benefits of these things, what you would call cardioprotective phenomena, stuff that you do that's actually protective and lowers your risk of heart disease. And I've now come to the conclusion, I've been out of the pharmaceutical industry in more than you know, 12 years, and I've come to the conclusion that one of these really powerful cardioprotective phenomena is actually kindness and compassionate behavior. Really, really strong. And, uh, but before I explain that, I wanted to also suggest that, ki that kindness has a very interesting side effect. And I think coming from a pharmaceutical background, we, you always thought of side effects on the negative, you know, the side effect of a drug, it makes you feel sick and all that kind of stuff. But actually, kindness has some very positive side effects. And a major side effect of kindness is happiness. Kindness makes us feel happier. And just to quote you one piece of research, there was a, a group who asked people, do you know those five a day rules that you get, if you take five pieces of fruit and vegetables a day, it's supposed to be really good for your, your health and your, your longevity. But it was like a five a day kindness study. So they were to pick one day of the week. So let's say you chose a Friday and that's your kindness day. So for the next six weeks, every Friday, you would do five acts of kindness on that day. And try to vary them so the following six week, the following Friday you'd perhaps mix them up and do other types of acts of kindness. And over the six weeks, they would do all their acts of kindness and make a, you know, really help a lot of people. Not necessarily all changing the world things, it was small things, just like uh, showing gratefulness for something, making someone a cup of tea, even, you know, smaller things as well. And at the end of the six weeks, they were compared against a group of people who weren't set out to do the kindness. And they were, the kindness group were substantially happier than the non-kindness group. And there's a growing body of research looking into this. Of course, we don't do kindness so that we can benefit from it to make ourselves happier. We do it because it's the right thing to do. But I think it's really interesting that it's a, that it's a positive side effect. And I think this comes in a few different ways. One, for, one of these ways is for many people, kindness is like a spiritual act, isn't it? You know, a, sometimes when we do something kind, it resonates with a part of us that says, yeah, this is what it's all about. This, is, this feels right, this is what I'm, I'm here for, this is what I'm supposed to do. So for many people, kindness is it's a spiritual kind of thing. So you resonate with that part of yourself and it just feels really, really good. But secondly, I would say that kindness is wired and as we're genetically wired to be kind. You know, that goes contrary to what a lot of people believe that we're wired to be selfish. You know, people quote the selfish gene and that's, that's re really misunderstood to mean that we're selfish by nature because actually, you know, our ancestors over hundreds of thousands, in fact, millions of years, evolved by helping each other out. They evolved in groups and communities. And the way evolution kind of works is the groups and communities with the strongest bonds are more likely to survive long periods of time. So one of the ways that you can create strong bonds, not the only way, of course, but one of the ways to create strong bonds in a group is to be kind and to, to show compassionate behavior. So what you find is that type of, nature selects the genes that predispose us to want to connect with each other. That's why we live in groups nowadays. And also, 
uh, nature selects genes that, that predispose us to do the things that we need to do to keep the bonds strong. So therefore, kindness becomes wired. I remember when I first started t- explaining this to people, people were saying, oh, that, that can't be right. We're definitely wired for selfishness. And we, we have, obviously, self-preservation is a big thing in us as well. And actually, that reminds me of one of my favorite jokes. Uh, two nature filmmakers were in the African savanna, and they're out in the open and they're filming stuff, and then a lion appears, and they're in this big open space, and the lion's moving towards them, you know, do the over-shoulder number thing. Like that. And they're looking at each other going, oh my God, what are we going to do? It's wide open space. So one of them bends down and starts putting on a pair of training shoes like that, just tighten them up like that. And, he's, and his pal looks around at him and says, there's no way you can outrun a lion. And he looks at his friend and said, as long as I can outrun you, <laughs> that's all that matters to me. <laughs> so we're wired for the, you know, the self-preservation, the selfishness as well. But I, I would suggest that kindness is actually the, the, the stronger of the two. And you know, acts of kindness and compassion also change brain chemistry. The studies of, of Buddhist monks who, are, who practice a meditation called loving kindness. You know, uh, may you be filled with loving kindness. May you be well. May you be peaceful and at ease. May you be happy. May you be free of suffering and, and project it out to people around the world reg- and repetitively. And, and they've shown to have structural changes in the brain. You know, physical changes in the brain, chemical changes, physiological changes in the brain on account through other research into the same field, on account of this cultivation of compassion and with an attitude of kindness. And what I also find interesting, what I, what I mentioned at the start, you know, women in, our, in the village that I grew up in, I grew up in a small village about, you know, a tiny wee place about that size. I mean, not actually that size, but on a map, if you did that, it's about half a mile. And, uh, <laughs> and, uh, and the women used to say, if you live from the heart, it's good from the heart, good for the heart. And there's a growing body of scientific evidence that would suggest that. And it centers around a, a wee hormone made of nine amino acids called oxytocin. Now, oxytocin is well known for its role in childbirth and breastfeeding. In fact, oxytocin is often given to induce labor, providing you're pregnant, of course. <laughs> and that you're female, just so that there's no misunderstanding here. But oxytocin is associated with warm contact, you know, hugging. You know, being in love, holding hands, having a nice exchange. Any, any type of warm contact between two humans, or even a human and an animal. Some research shows interacting with a dog for a period of time increases oxytocin levels in the human and the dog. Right? So any kind of warm contact produces it. But researchers years ago noticed that when women were breastfeeding, that's a time when oxytocin levels are really high. They found that their blood pressure was lower. And they, they hypothesized that that was probably something to do with oxytocin. So research has now looked at inside the body, and it turns out the entire cardiovascular system, all your veins, arteries, and capillaries, they're lined with little binding sites. Like, they call them receptor sites. It's like wee docking ports. You know, if a spacecraft was that shape, three, three pins in the ground, three pins in its bottom, it would have to land on a docking port the same shape. So you have the same type of idea in the body. You have a a little hormone like oxytocin of a certain shape. Let's say it's the shape of a heart. And there's lots of heart-shaped binding sites or receptor sites that line your your arteries. And it turns out that oxytocin binds onto these wee landing sites on the insides of your blood vessels. And among other things, it causes the production of nitric oxide. Now, not nitrous oxide, which is laughing gas that you get at the dentist, but nitric oxide. And what happens then is your, blood, your arteries go like that, and they expand. You get dilation, and that drops your blood pressure. So here you have a, a, a cardioprotective effect of this little hormone oxytocin. The reason I'm, I'm saying that is because I'm, I'm proposing that kindness and compassionate behavior, ways in which you would therefore produce oxytocin, because kindness and compassionate behavior are ways to produce warm contact. Right? So I would des- therefore suggest that kindness and compassionate behavior is a cardioprotective phenomena, would therefore cause this expansion of your arteries. In fact, other research takes it a bit further and looked at uh, in test tubes, took vascular cells, so cells from the blood vessels, and even immune cells, put them in test tubes uh, and you know, cultivate, cultured them, and, and put them under a lot of stress. And the stress was meant to simulate, the t- you know, the type of mental and emotional stress or lifestyle stress we put ourselves under. 
in our lives. And what they found is two high levels of two of the main culprits in cardiovascular disease. Free radicals are oxidative stress, and the other one was inflammation. But they did the experiment again, but this time in the presence of oxytocin. Bear in mind that we produce oxytocin through warm contact with each other. And what they found, depending on which cell type they used, 24 to 48% reduction in free radicals or oxidative stress, up to 56% reduction in inflammation. Now, for my time in the pharmaceutical industry, if you could get that from a drug, we'd be pretty happy. We'd be really, really happy. And isn't this amazing that through how we lead our lives, how we treat each other, that we can produce some of these effects? You know, not necessarily wait until we're sick, but doing this to prevent ourselves from getting sick, among other things. And this type, although that was done in test tubes, and the test tubes don't always translate and to have the same effect in the human body, but I'd suggest that a lot of other evidence would say that it probably does translate into the, human, into the same effect in the human body. You only have to look at a thing called the Rosetto effect. Rosetto is a small town on the east coast of the United States. During a 1960s census, they found that hardly anyone in Rosetto had ever died of heart disease. And even up to old age, that the death rate was substantially lower than anywhere else in the United States. So scientists around the world descended in this place and what on earth is going on here? Why is no one getting sick here? And it turned out, after they sampled the water and looked at the diets and all that kind of stuff, it turned out what protected the residents of Rosetto from heart disease was each other. They had a high degree of social interconnectedness. Everyone knew everyone else. Everyone connected and bonded with each other. Everyone, they had regular social things. You know, the old women knew the middle names of every, you know, all the, the kids in the street. You know, so that this high level of interconnectedness, you know, friendships, much more connectedness than you would normally get. And it turned out that's what had protected them from cardiovascular disease. And I would suggest that oxytocin was one of the main elements in that protective kind of thing. And even, therefore, kindness. There was probably a lot of kindness in that whole kind of thing. And there's another study that I like, one of my favorite pieces of research, called Marital Conflict Relations and Coronary Artery Calcification. <laughs> <laughs> Marital Conflict Relations and Coronary Artery Calcification. That's where scientists had 150 married couples, put them in a room, one couple at a time, and videotaped them while they talked about, you know, a marital issue or a challenge. And eventually they could categorize in, into how they acted in their relationships. And at one end of the extreme, you had like hostile, aggressive behavior and even domineering behavior. At the other end, you had warm contact, you know, oxytocin type contact, warm contact. And what they found is in women, when there was high amounts of hostility and aggression towards the partner, and if the partner was reciprocating, there was also high levels of, car of cardiovascular disease. But when there was warmth, it was like a cardioprotective phenomena, much, much lower levels. And with the men in particular, if there was domineering behavior, high amounts of dominance over the, the women, also characterized by high levels of cardiovascular disease. Whereas the other end of the extreme, warmth, again, cardioprotective. And I would suggest it's because of this connecting, warm connecting, which produces, which flows the taps of oxytocin that was doing that. So I love this kind of research because it really adds weight to that little thing that I learned when I was a child that, you know, a, if you live from the heart, it's good for the heart. And, and I've, I started going into researching the science of this because I felt, I noticed that when people talk about kindness, if I could present it in a different way, people talk about kindness, I noticed that they're more likely to do kind things for other people. And I, I really have that belief that a small group of people with compassion and kindness in their hearts can change the world. It's like a little ripple effect. You know, you drop a pebble in a pond and it was plop and you get little waves. Another end of the pond, a little lily pad goes like that. And it's got no idea why it's doing that. But the reason it's doing that is because you dropped a pebble in the pond. Think of the pebble as an act of kindness. And you get this ripple effect. You know this, like pay it forwards, the pay it forward movement. Someone does something for you, kind, so you do something for someone else. You get this kind of ripple effect. And, uh, and also, I find, sto I love hearing stories about kindness. I I've got a few friends who live in, in Scotland, and they have a little centre where regularly they have little social gatherings. And, and one night they were having a little gathering, they sent inv invitations out to people that they knew. And an invitation had gone to this elderly lady called Dorothy, who actually phoned up and said, it's my friends Tom and Linda, and phoned up Tom and said, I'm really sorry, Tom, I can't make it, but thank you so much for inviting me, for even thinking of me. 
but I'm really sorry, I can't make it. It's the dark nights and I need to get three buses, but thanks anyway. And Tom says, where do you live? I'm coming to get you. So Tom jumps in his van and he's driving through the streets of Glasgow and he gets to the bottom of this great big hill and there's a, a, a young lad walking up the hill carrying a great big TV and he's really struggling. And Tom's a really nice guy. He jumps out of his car and he says, out of the van, and he says, excuse me, can I help you? And the guy goes, no, I'm fine. Tom goes, no, no, I'm helping you. And the guy can't even argue, so Tom pulls the, the TV into the van and he drives over the hill, it's about a mile long, over this bridge and down the other end of the hill. And the young guy says, right, thanks, I'll get off here. So Tom helps him out with the TV and the guy puts his hand in his pocket and he tries to give him some money. And Tom says, I don't want your money. And the guy was going, well, this is what we do in Scotland. I'm paying you back. You did something for me, I'm paying you back. So Tom explained to him the philosophy of paying, paying it forward and said, see if we all did pay it forward, you know, the world could be a better place and our communities would be better, safer, your families would be happier, the world would be great. And the guy's like, oh, this is good. I wish you were my teacher at school. This is, I wish I'd learned this at school. And the guy's really totally inspired. So Tom goes away and he picks up Dorothy. And he's driving by about 15 minutes later. He's driving up the hill that he's just came down. He's over the top and he's half, and you know, he's halfway up the hill. And he sees the same young guy and he's walking up the hill again with the TV. And Tom's going, what on earth is he doing? So he pulled over, he says, excuse me, my friend, I've just driven you over the hill and down. Why are you going back up it? He says, you know, I really got what you said there about paying it forward and making a difference in the world. He said, I stole the TV, so I'm taking it back. <laughs> Thank you very much. That's done.